Hey folks, Rob Avis here again. Uh, this is live stream number two of three today. It's uh, kind of a crazy live streaming day. And so today uh, for live stream number two, I've got two incredible guests with me, uh, Mark, Mark Analeski and Dakota Cohen. And today we're gonna be talking about um, economics and permaculture. And specifically, um, if you take a look at the, the title there, we've got, um, we're gonna be talking about well-being and specifically the Alberta economy, which is pretty poignant right now. Uh, if you've been following the news, even if you haven't been following the news, it seems to be impossible to ignore uh, the rhetoric around, uh, and I don't even know if rhetoric is the right word, the dialogue that's going on in this province right now around the economy um, and decisions that are or are not being made. Uh, and there definitely is rhetoric around that as well. And I think a lot of misinformation um, about what's going on behind the scenes. And so uh, this opportunity to have a conversation with Mark uh, came totally out of the blue and uh, we had to make it happen and it ended up uh, landing on today. And so we're gonna be kind of doing a combination of things. We're actually recording today's interview, uh, which will end up showing up on Mark's website a little bit later as a podcast. So if you prefer the audio format, uh, you're going to be able to find that. And I've put a link to his URL down below. Um, and uh, of course, this interview will be live on our YouTube channel going forward. Now, um, if you've never heard of Mark, um, I got introduced to him uh, at a conference in Red Deer. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. Mark probably remembers. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever um, heard him speak um, or even heard of his work. And it completely floored me. It was uh, well, probably one of the most inspiring conversations um, that he, he gave. It was a presentation, but it, it came across more like a conversation. Um, the number of slides that he presented in a period of time, I mean, the guy's got an encyclopedic brain. Uh, he's got more information up there than, uh, than most people um, and has done a lot of analysis on um, the state of this province and, and, uh, and, and juxtap juxtaposed it to a lot of other places in the world. Uh, Bhutan is the one that comes to mind right now. And um, the book that he was referring to or talking about uh, at the last conference was actually um, this guy right here, which I highly recommend. It's a, a book from New Society Publishers. And I'll make sure that I put a link to that in the show notes below as well, um, a little bit later. Um, and if you've seen the thumbnail, um, his most recent book, uh, which is The Economy of Wellbeing, is what we're going to have a conversation with. Um, uh, about today. And so I just wanted to uh, let Dakota and Mark introduce themselves. So Mark, why don't you go first and uh, give us a little bit of a um, of your bio for folks that haven't uh, uh, heard of you. And um, and then I'll let Dakota uh, chime in as well and, and just introduce himself as well. Oh, Mark, you might need to uh, uh, unmute your mic there. There we go. Thanks, Robin. Hi, Dakota. Uh, hey, I was actually reaching out to Dakota that uh, I think led to this little uh, podcast. So uh, because Dakota inspired me talking about permaculture, large scale. So this, this is my new book, An Economy of Wellbeing, and uh, it was published in May of last year. Uh, so my background, economist, uh, started in, in the audit accounting world, uh, uh, then became a forced economist by profession with the Alberta government. And I've spent most of my career since about 2000 in the consulting world, consulting to governments from China to Tahiti to little towns in Alberta about how to measure well-being, how to account for well-being as a basis of economic progress. And I uh, also sit on the Provincial Audit Committee of Alberta. Alberta raised kid, born in Calgary, raised in Edmonton. And uh, yeah, I've been around the block, so to speak. And so I have uh, some ideas about how we can reshape and even reboot this economy called Alberta. Great. Dakota, why don't you uh, do a quick intro here too? Sure. My name is Dakota Cohen. Uh, I farm a 250 acre mixed organic farm with my parents, Michael and Laura, up by Ferentosh, Alberta. And yeah, we, we raise all kinds of stuff. Uh, we've been organic for 30 years and, and our whole mission in life is to help heal the health of, of uh, the people in, in Alberta and to help heal the ecosystems that we all depend upon. Awesome. So I, I'm curious uh, because I kind of came into the conversation a little bit uh, later. Uh, 
this is a question for Dakota and for Mark. Uh, what what spawned this sudden desire to talk about economics and permaculture, and and um, what what happened in that conversation that created the this opportunity? Well, if you want me to go first, I mean, I, Dakota. Dakota and I were at a conference in Edmonton, what was it, two years ago, uh, yeah. permaculture conference. I've, I've studied permaculture for, as an economist, I've always been intrigued with it. I'm a forester, of course, so I, I think in those terms. And uh, I've always thought that, why doesn't the economy behave like permacultural science in, in the sense of, you know, every, there's, there's no such thing as waste. Uh, you know, everything is moving, hopefully, to a state of homeostasis optimization. And yet our economies act more like cancer than they do natural ecosystems. At least uh, we, we manage them that way. And uh, it's time to end cancer. And it's time to, you know, develop an economy that um, is worthy of affection, that's flourishing, um, that's resilient. Uh, it's not based on exponential permanent growth but is actually one that uh, where well-being is, you know, the ultimate aspiration. And I think nature, nature is the model. Nature teaches us. Nature is perfect in the sense. Uh, so we have every right and every responsibility to design our economies in kind of the permacultural uh, style, I would say. Cool. So, I mean, from your perspective, Mark, we don't get economists uh, coming across this, or at least in our bubbles anyways. Um, coming across this type of stuff very often. And so how does, how does some of these ideas around permaculture uh, play into the work that you do and, and also the opportunities that you see uh, within the province of Alberta? Uh, great question. So I, you know, from what I know about permaculture, uh, in a sense, if you think about all, you know, all energy is, is interconnected. Uh, everything's relational. Um, in an economic system, you have uh, assets like people and relationships and nature, and they all talk to each other. They're hopefully uh, in a kind of optimized state of, of well-being. And so the economic model, which should be based on, I've argued, a kind of a proper balance sheet approach of the province. In other words, what are the assets of the province, the land, forest, the people, how, how are we doing? What are the, the word wealth means the conditions of well-being. So what are those conditions of well-being currently? What's our balance sheet? We have no balance sheet for the province as such. And so you can't operate a farm. Sometimes maybe you can't operate a farm without a balance sheet because the farm is cash flow management, but it should be asset-based management. It should be about the soil, right? So that's what permaculture is about. We've got to build, make sure the soil is healthy so it has natural productivity. And how do you measure the health of the soil? Do you taste it? Do you use all kinds of other metrics to like diagnose diagnosis of the body? So how how healthy, what is the state of well-being of our economy? And if we were to again base the economic system and management based on sort of permacultural principles, we would first of all map out all these complex relationships in the economy, we'd say, gosh, we've got tons of oil on the ground, but how much do we have to extract next year? Do we really need pipelines? What about a renewable energy capacity? What about the people? You know, uh, what about mental illness or other things that are, right, liabilities detracting from the well-being of society? And now we're gonna manage based on uh, what Bobby Kennedy said, you know, measures of what makes life worthwhile, not just making more money and producing more oil oil simply because we think we have to get out of the ground faster so um, and I know Dakota has has all sorts of things he wants to ask you but I I, I don't get to um, ask economists this question very often and I want to set the stage before Dakota uh, jumps in and starts asking some incredible questions we had a conversation about this before we got live on YouTube today um, set the stage for for the for Albertans, but also for non-Albertans that are looking at this channel from the outside, looking in, um, where has our economy come from? Where is it currently? And barring that we don't make major course corrections, where is it going? Uh, 
Well, where the economy you know, came from, I mean, if you, you think about it, way before we arrived here, uh, there were indigenous people in the land and they had a very elaborate system of uh, economic uh, relationships. In Edmonton, for example, they would gather here, they called it the Pehonen, the great gathering place on Turtle Island. And they had an elaborate system of exchange using seashells as currency. Uh, and if you know First Nations, they always talk about all my relations when you go into a sweat lodge. So you say, where did it all start? Well, it started maybe 10,000 years ago. Uh, and then we arrived. And what did we do? We, um, we took, you know, stole their culture. We created our property rights and made quarter sections and started farming. And, and, um, and then, of course, we also extracted natural resources like oil, which we, you know, discovered. And we have technology to extract all that oil sands. So we have um, assets that we think are critical to our economic well-being. And yet we have sort of uh, squandered in some ways, some of those assets. So our whole economy is based on, you know, the extraction of natural resources, uh, the export. And the, the other thing I want to point out, which is the history of Canada. If you think about it, Canada was basically established by the first corporation uh, under Queen Elizabeth I, you know, the British East Indian Company. And so you had a corporation which came and basically took the assets of Turtle Island, extracted the value, right? And, uh, and nothing, nothing's changed ever since. And the whole model end is based on export. We just have to keep exporting more stuff to generate more money. And there's never enough money. And there's, you know, there's no limit to how much you can extract and, and export. And then all these externalities you produce like pollution uh, or tailing ponds in Fort McMurray don't get treated properly as un, what I call unfunded liabilities, right? Which are risks or future well-being. So you've got all of these uh, strange um, anomalies. In fact, um, violations of basic accounting principles. You know, you have to measure your assets. You have to account for your liabilities. You have to account for equity, which is the distribution of wealth and well-being. So where are we going if if we don't? correct these accounting uh, mistakes? Well, I think where we go is we, we sort of, um, I was described GDP, gross domestic product, like the joystick on a, on a 747 jetliner. Uh, you don't know where you're going because you don't have a, a proper inventory of what you have. So the first thing I would do if I was the finance minister is I'd ask for a comprehensive audit inventory of the assets of this province. So we say, where, where do we want to go now? Um, because we, yeah, we have lots of oil. We have amazing agricultural lands. We may have some really innovative people like Dakota and his family doing permaculture agriculture. And the onus then is on all of us to demonstrate that his approach to agriculture is maybe better for the soil and better for long term well-being than industrial agriculture. So, that's the only way we know where we're going to go. If we know, if we have a map, our map then becomes is the well-being assessment, yeah. and then we govern on that basis. We make budgetary decisions on that basis. Right now, we're operating without that balance sheet, which means that the only rhetoric is more growth. You know, let's get back to the good old days when oil was a hundred bucks a barrel. It's not coming back, and. Um, and whether we build a pipeline or not, does it really matter? Let's have an honest debate about, and let's talk about our renewable energy opportunities, which are enormous. We could be far ahead of Germany very soon if we just kept keep going uh, with renewables. Um, so, so suddenly we can imagine an economy that's actually pretty resilient and Albertans using our, our best you know, ideas and innovations to chart a new course. And Rob, one of the things I mentioned, one of my big points is we, we have these incredible financial institutions like ATB Financial, which is the biggest public bank in North America. When I say public, it means you and I, we all are shareholders in this bank. It was created 80 years ago under social credit government. That means basically we have our own ATM and we could create enough money in terms of financing, whatever we want. We can have permaculture farm across Alberta if we wanted to. Uh, so the question is, why don't we do it? 
Why don't we use the full power of the of our public bank? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Mark, one of the things that that really pops out for me as you're describing this is is the um, is the three ethics of permaculture, uh, which is essentially care of the earth, you know, looking after the, the the planet and kind of all of our all of our other relations, yeah. <clears throat> looking after people and making sure that there's there's uh, you know equity and 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 everybody's treated fairly. And the, the third one is is future care, so looking after uh, the the well being of of you know our relations and and all the other organisms on this planet, so that we can all have the highest level of well being possible for as long as possible. Right, right. And I mean the, that's so it's, it's Earth care, people care, and future care are like the the central um, central goals, the central vision of of permaculture as a movement. And it's just, you know, it's, it's so, uh, the, the first time I, I heard you speak, I was just blown away that there's, you know, somebody who, who has an understanding of, of economics and who's in a position like, like yourself, who, who thinks like this. It's just, it's, <laughs> it, so I guess the question is, like, why is this a revolutionary idea? <laughs> that's, that's a great question, Dakota, like, where's common sense, right? Yeah. What you've just said is just common sense. I mean, our grandparents knew this. My grandparents were farmers, right? From Saskatchewan or Austria. It was just common sense back then. And it's, yeah. you know, when, if, if we said organic a hundred years ago, they'd say, what, what's that? You know, yeah. we're, we are organic. <laughs> we have to pull weeds by hand, you know? And uh, so I, it, it's, it is fascinating. You're thinking like in how many years, how many generations have we sort of, I don't know, lost lost the thread, um, and we have all this technology. You know, we have we have cryptocurrencies, we have artificial intelligence coming, and but yet the indigenous wisdom, what I what I would call my friend Carolyn Hilton calls indigenomics. You know, what does indigenomics teach us right now? What what should we do? And we we need to take care of all our relations, including the earth, and think seven generations out. We actually have to operate that way. Because it actually just makes sense. The way they operated makes so much sense today in the state of the world today. I mean, the states in a, you know, the place is in a mess, whether it's Britain or United States. And we need a, we just need a different common sense economic approach here um, that doesn't get caught up in rhetoric and, and hot air and just says, okay. As you said, let's think about these three basic principles, and then how would we operate an economy of perma based on permaculture? Well, how about money based on permacultural principles? What is the equivalent of money in nature, except sunlight, maybe? And I would say, what gives without expectation the sun? And yet we 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 treat money as if like, you know, we have to hoard it. We have to. What happens to water when you hoard it, when you put it behind a dam, right? It stagnates. So like money must flow. Money must be, we use words like liquidity and banks. Think about it. The banks of the river, liquidity, currency, all the words of nature are used for money. And, and then we kind of go crazy thinking that we have to hoard it and accumulate it in fewer hands. And somehow getting rich quick is the path to happiness. And it's just not. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, one of the things I, I really like that really struck me when um, when uh, you're describing your, your new book and and your previous book is is the idea of, of of you know the titles are you know happiness, the economy of happiness, and the economy of well being. And I just are you familiar with uh, Sam Harris's uh, uh, recent book um, called the the Moral Landscape? No, but I want to read it because I saw not to mention like get you know everyone upset about the, the recent Gillette commercial or Jordan Peterson um, but I saw Sam Harris and Jordan on stage on YouTube the other day and and it blew me away I hit I hit pause because uh, Sam said to Jordan is like for me he said everything is about well-being yeah and 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 Jordan said well it's about being for me and I'm like wow these two crazy guys who are you know, bigger than life right now in Canada and controversial are talking about what I'm talking about. 
yeah. and my well-being. Yeah. And I think that is incredible. Yeah. And so the um, you know essentially the, the central premise of uh, of Sam's book is that is that you know for the last couple hundred years science has kind of stayed away from like the the the, the values and, and ethics based conversation because you know we can't talk about the the subjective world through a scientific right. premise and so we only talk about you know things and how things interact and so basically Sam's central idea is that we actually can talk about uh, subjective values uh, objectively and and it's as as simple as this is is um, there's this moral landscape where there's peaks and valleys and that there's, there's, you know, optimal well-being, which are the peaks. And there's like the most miserable conditions you can imagine are like heaven and hell is, is yeah. Yeah. and, and we can all agree objectively that being on the peaks or having the most well-being possible for as many uh, organisms for as long as possible is objectively better than being at the bottom of the valley when you just imagine the worst case scenario where it's, you know, like World War Three type scenarios, you know, global famines, the, like all that stuff. It's like the, the, if all we need to do is agree that there's a difference between the peaks and the valleys and that and agree on which direction we want to head as as um, as a species. And and for me, like that is such a a, uh, a fundamental insight to have that that really all these conversations are. Uh, and the problems that we're having in the world right now are stemming from the fact that we just don't have a goal as a species. I think you've nailed it. I mean, you said the most important word, better. You know, all of us aspire, yes, we'll have valleys, we'll have lousy days, we'll have potholes yeah. of despair and disappointment, right? anxiety. We'll all have that. That's life. But... Yeah we could collectively aspire to be better to feel better and so one of the things i'm working on most recently is i call it soul printing for lack of a better word to get to soul, soul, soul printing soul print so i'm using a well-being survey tool 36 questions and it everything from how you sleep at night how you feel about your neighbor your relationship with money including the, your self-rating of your soul and you it creates a score, okay? Oh, cool. So the idea is, what's life about? Life is about helping each other, right? So Cody, you might be a lousy financial manager. You don't even know how to write a business plan, but I do. And I'm willing to spend one hour of my 750,000 hours of life energy, which is what a typical male will have in Alberta, right? And But I'm willing to you know, help you so that I I end that relation, that one hour feeling, do I feel better about who I am? Did I serve you? Did I get some joy out of that relationship? That's an immutable in the blockchain world. That's an immutable well-being dividend. Yeah. Right. That I can literally, whether I ever take it to the bank or not. But what we're doing is we're giving uh, strength to the perception of well-being, which is as valuable as any objective measure. Right. Because yeah. I. I'm asking you how you feel about yourself without, there's no right or wrong score. You might go through your life like, you know, like this and suddenly you have one good day, one, and your happiness went up 30% and stays yeah. there, right? And so, yeah, I think we need to give more credit to our perceptions of well-being. And the interesting thing, we don't ask Albertans how happy they are. It's like, we don't care. We don't care how people sleep in this province. Um, we don't care, We oh yeah, we know there's mental illness, but we, what are we, how are we helping each other, you know, work through the bipolar, the whatever it is that we're experiencing. And um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, for better. What a great political platform, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's ironic that you know, all around, not only in Alberta, but the, the entire world right now, the only, or not, the, the predominant metric that we use to, to judge uh, whether an idea was good or bad um, was, did it contribute to growth? 
of you know GDP of the community, GDP of of you know the province, the state, the, the and then yeah. eventually goes into the world. And um, you know, one of the things that I, I found, uh, I mean, there's obvious. Um, we we've been playing out that that uh, that game for you know, the last couple hundred years now, and and I think we were really just all the feedback which are catching up with us in terms of what happens when you when the only metric you use is based on on growth and so so just yeah sorry. go ahead mark no i just i just want to riff on why that is why is growth why is the rhetoric of growth the constant global rhetoric Let, let's talk yeah. about that yeah well. go ahead so my premise is and my mentors taught me this the reason I think the economy needs to keep growing is because the economy is based on debt money. Okay. So guess what happens with debt money? It grows exponentially over time. Since World War II, you see the growth and it becomes cancer like. So right now the typical American household is spending half of their life energy working for hidden interest charges on $70 trillion of bank created debt. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. If I ran for president, I would give all Americans a 20 hour work week, not 50 or 40, because I would end it all. I would end kind of the slavery of debt, completely unnecessary. Uh, Americans don't understand why they fought the Revolutionary War. It was for that reason, to decouple from the bondage of private bank debt. Not saying banks are bad, just saying when you have the opportunity to create money without any cost, without interest, and you don't do it, you don't have, then, my, then I cannot go to sleep tonight and, and not think that I didn't do enough to help my fellow Albertan, you know, go get through that anxiety about financial crises and debt. That we, we cannot say that we didn't know that we could solve the Alberta's deficit problem. So th this is a really key point because the economy has to keep growing to service the unrepayable debt. Yep. So that's where the pressure comes. More growth, of course more growth, because guess what happens? 9-11 stalls out, right? Uh, you had a stall out in 9-11. You had a complete stall out in 2008 in the financial crisis. You see the U.S. Debt, go, debt curve go flat for a bit and then resume with the bailouts, right? And all that happened is more debt was created. And so that 50 cents will go to 55 cents. will go to 60 cents on every dollar. And eventually you take all your money. So... I mean, Mark, you're talking about a complete systemic shift in how in the mechanics of the economy, <clears throat> at least in terms of, of how value is exchanged right now. And I've talked to Richard Heinberg recently, and I talked to Dmitry Orlov recently about this very issue and how uh, basically, I mean, there's only four ways that you can increase debt in an economy. It's consumer, which I think we, based on what you just said, we've we're we're maxed out. And, and there's not really much point in going much further along that road. There's debt the business can take on. There's debt that the government can take on. And then there's debt that the financial industry can take on. The financial industry is also maxed out. And so the government's really the last stop, if you will. How do we get from here where we are right now, knowing that the system is mathematically set to fail? We don't know when it will, but it mathematically cannot function to a new paradigm. How, what does that transition look like? Is it a lack of leadership? Um, and how does Alberta do that, given that we're part of Canada? Yes, we have the ATB, but it, are, are we talking about creating a new currency? Um, I don't know. There's lots wrapped up in there. I'm just curious if we can bring it from the conceptual down to some some yeah. examples that people yeah. can visualize. So that you're right, that the systemic problem is, as Orloff would say, it's collapse. That's the only way it's only what path forward. Only when the whole thing collapses, what well, might we wake up and say, is there a different way? Because all we've done is repeated the, the errors of the past. This this is not the first time it happened. 
but now we have a global integrated debt system, except for a few exceptions, China, which adopted a dead president's model, Abraham Lincoln's model. Lincoln said, we'll create the money for the people. We don't need the private banks financing the civil war, right? And he got killed for it. Mm -hmm. So people don't understand what China has. China has the only sovereign wealth money system in the world, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Uh, is Canada, is there an opportunity to do something bold in Canada? Uh, I've argued that we already have an existing public bank called ATB. No other province has it. The Bank of Canada itself, when Trudeau was pr uh, prime minister in 1974, and other Western countries gave away the power of money creation from the public bank to the private banks. Yep. Happened in a place called Basel, Switzerland, um, right? It was a deal that was cut, but was there any parliamentary debate about this? And I could show you the evidence. What happens is Alberta's, or sorry, Canada's debt to GDP ratio goes from 150% to now 360% and growing. Same in the US. So can you take out any of the, um, can you reboot this thing? Not easily. Because guess what? We're all kind of wedded, right? We're all invested in getting our returns, whether it's pension funds or own money, right? That's the complexity of this. So we'd have to have a global agreement to literally reboot the system. Maybe learn from the Chinese. How come you guys are doing it? Why do you think the Chinese can build empty office towers in Shanghai because they just write off those debts, right? Because they're sovereign and every country should go that in that direction. But unless there's a, first of all, there's acknowledgement that the current system is, is cancer, it's broken. It cannot stand it. Uh, or we end up actually flirting with war, right? Which is what typically happens. And war is good for the economy, right? It's like you blow it up and you have to rebuild it. And I'm saying, wait a minute, stop for a moment. There is a different operating model. So before we blow ourselves up, let's pause. Uh, think about what the alternatives are. Point to Alberta, point to China, point to other places. Seashells even, you know? Yeah. How could we use seashells? Are we gonna use seashells for money? I don't know. Seems ridiculous, but but my point is we can actually create, we have the power to create money in, in parallel with the assets of the, of the nation, of the province, in perfect, in a crypto blockchain world, in such perfect sophistication that we can generate living wages. In fact, we create enough money never to pay taxes. Think about that. Because money is just a derivative of an asset. So this is what's before us. This, this is the debate that should, should be happening in Alberta. And, and in fact, in any jurisdiction anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, why is it not? And I'm not talking about revolutionary ideas. These are common sense, practical things we could do tomorrow. Yeah. When, what, one of the things that's, that's you know, standing out for me with, with, as you're saying this, Mark, is, is uh, I'm familiar with, with some of the work that Rob and I are doing right now, um, trying to uh, work with with uh, land stewards on an on individual basis to give them kind of the tools and resources so that they can, they can create their own uh, adaptive habitat that creates, you know, the optimal well-being for them and their families. Right. And because... Right. There's, you know, these are these are really big problems that are like you just said. Like, like what about what about pensions? What about you know? Or the, another one that uh, I, I heard uh, Brett Weinstein talk about um, in the the on an interview with with Joe Rogan recently was it's like we can't afford a revolution if the power shuts off for more than a couple of weeks. Yeah, all the nuclear reactors in North America. It's like we so revolution isn't an answer. Collapse isn't an answer. We have to figure out another way out of this. Yeah. And the, the, but the, and that's super overwhelming, but the way that, that, that Rob and I look at, at these problems is, is it, it doesn't matter um, that the how isn't what's important. It's the why and, and, and having some kind of a, a process that allows you to work through and problem solve and have, you know, have a, have a critical thinking process that has humility baked into it so that 
we can just start using empiricism and, and trial and error and, and you know, learning from other, other countries, natural principles, all these other things um, so that we can, but the, the first step is, okay, something's wrong. Like the, this, this isn't working. You know, the entire world's GDP is, uh, you know, 300 plus trillion dollars right now. It's 300% of, of, of the total world's GDP, all these other problems. Um, and then the second step is, okay, we're, we're all like, we, we, we don't like where we are. We wanna go somewhere different. And then it's just having a, an adaptive process to, to make decisions towards moving us towards that. But we're stuck on this uh, rhetoric of just growth, 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 growth. We, we, we can't do anything else. And that's why I, I just, I love your, uh, the fact that you have well-being and happiness. It's like, those are the goals. And, and like, you know, we, we know what the problems are. We know what the goals are. Let's, let's get together and, and problem solve to, um, so in the process that we use, we call it our vision and our values. So the vision is, is like the, the place that we're heading and the values are the, the, the day-to-day things that are important to us. So it's like, you know, how well are you sleeping? Do you have a good relationship with your family? Uh, you know, the, what's your internal dialogue like and, and paying attention to those indicators right. and, um, yeah, it's just it's super exciting to hear, you know, the the same principles that that Rob and I have been hammering on for the last couple of years in our educational work, being said back to us in in this in this way. So let's, yeah, that's awesome. So I think I think you've said. I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it is about the why, and then it's or the why not because yeah, know, we yeah, the why not. we know. We know there's an alternative. Uh, we might not like, we might not fully understand the alternative. We need experiments. We need to say, let's go visit uh, Cohen Farm and find out what the heck is this, you know, permaculture agriculture about. And maybe we actually get romantic about it and, and do, do a full cost accounting of it and or convince ourselves because we need that evidence that it's actually more fun, better, and mm-hmm. longer sustainability uh, for Alberta's agricultural future. I mean, but we owe it to ourselves to do the math. And, and, uh, and that's been my point too, is like, you're right. We need, we need to demonstrate that these ideas aren't just their brain. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that's, those are the questions I ask. I, I keep asking why, why can't Alberta hold its own debt? And then, Guess what you get? You're like, I don't know. I said, what are the rules? I don't know. How much debt can our Alberta Investment Management Corp hold of Alberta's debt? I don't know. What do you mean? We make the rules, you know? And uh, so you just keep asking these, you know, seven-year-old why questions and really smart people get confused. Or yeah. you say, okay, let's, this is new. This is a new, there are new rules to this game. And uh, why, why are we s- still stuck on the growth paradigm when it's actually not, it's not resulting in better lives per se. More money is buying more happiness. We see that with the collapse in oil prices. Doesn't matter, matter how much money you make, you, you spend most of it, right? And uh, anyways, it's time for, a, I think it's time for a, a mature conversation in this province. It seems really difficult to imagine that right now. I mean, populist politics seems to be uh, spreading virally right across the the country. It's amazing how often when I leave my little bubble of influence, um, how often people that I speak with start blaming their problems on Notley or on this or on that. And it's like, well, hold on. They're all kind of going for the same thing. Actually, it's has nothing. It's not parties at this point. Um, and you and I were talking just before this, Mark, about how like the, the analogy or the, the similarities between the loss of cod in Newfoundland and the effects that that had on that province, yeah. um, we're, we're almost at that point now in Alberta. I mean, we've got electric cars coming onto the market in the next three to five years, and whether or not those create the disruption that everybody's claiming they will, um, there's another whole conversation going on about um, the 
abundance of shale gas and oil, which has all sorts of other environmental consequences. Um, and a lot of people seem to turn a blind eye to that and kind of just move ahead. And so if that becomes true, then maybe there's a surplus of oil and gas on the planet. If it's not true, it's devastating for all sorts of other reasons. Yeah. It, it yeah, seems yeah. like it's difficult to, to move beyond a Twitter or a tweet um, <laughs> and, and actually have a meaningful conversation about, it's almost like the pipelines are just a diversion away from, from reality. Um, and we're all putting all of our energy and time and money into getting reelected, buying trains and pipelines. And I'm not criticizing the complexity or trying to simplify down what, what Rachel's going through in, in, you know, at the legislation, but, but I, I just wonder how we actually bring the public into this meaningful, mature conversation about it. It's, it's actually not about pipelines. It's about the fact that we're sitting on a resource that's a lot worse than everybody thinks it is. Um, that's really going to play a, a smaller role in the future. And that if a, if a pipeline is a 30 year investment, yeah. Investment, yeah. Um, you know, the thing that I, I actually have this in the show notes right down below, I have a, a national geographic documentary on Singapore. I'm wondering if you've studied that like 50 I've, years I've ago. Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. 50 years ago. And I'd, like, I'd love to get your take on this 50 years ago. They started reinventing themselves. I've got a couple of stats mm -hmm. out of it. Um, 50 years ago, they had a third of the population. They had 1% of their current GDP growth and little to no infrastructure. And now they're moving towards 100% renewable energy, 100% food production. Uh, they're modeling their cities around ecosystems. Um, and, and it's like, what, what is it in their culture that allowed them to think five decades into the future? And yet we can't, you know, get past pipelines. Well, I've, I've been to Singapore twice. I've written that. I think I've told them I've been there with the richest guy in Singapore and it's not the, not based on the movie, you know, crazy. They are incredible people. Uh, and, and, and because of their isolation, you see, they were kicked out by their Malaysian brothers, right? Because they wouldn't adopt uh, Islam as their only religion. That was 50 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. I was invited there in July to a conversation. I was one of the, only Westerners there called Honor Singapore. It was, what are we gonna do the next 50 years? Our okay. kids are grumbling because our kids think maybe we're bought, our parents bought us all this nonsense that we have to study hard, work hard. But I, I came away saying, Singapore is the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world next to Norway. Hmm. I met the CEO and we talked about how this economy for the next 50 years can be the model for the for the world. 90% of their housing is in public trusts, these beautiful condos where you can't just cash out your condo and move to wherever. Uh, that capital gain goes into the financial wealth fund, which is then yours to, you know, to finance your retirement, right? I meet wonderful, happy seniors who just drive a cab or an Uber because actually Uber went away. Uber disappeared because I met the young guy who replaced Uber with a with a more integral model of a good relationship with the drivers and their families. The guy's 35 years old. It's unbelievable, <laughs> right? And and the, Jack Ma, who owns Alibaba, says, I will always point to Singapore as a model for doing business with honor, wow. as honor is still the hallmark of good business, where you did deals on a napkin, not with legalese and, you know, that's still there with a strong, ironically, a strong Christian ethic. Billy Graham came there in 62, said Singapore is the Antioch of Asia. What does that mean, the Antioch of Asia? Right? It is the happiest Asian country. It ranks 34th, well ahead of Bhutan, this, you know, with, which ranked 87th in the World Happiness Poll. So does Singapore have its challenges? Of course, the most densely populated place on earth, second largest seaport. They're rebuilding and building a brand new port, second largest seaport in the world. It's no natural resources. A pipeline, a water pipeline that delivers fresh water from Malaysia that they cut the deal in 1965. If the Malaysians cut the pipeline off, they're like hooped, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I'm like, wait a minute. Sovereign Wealth Fund, which you, now I'm talking to the director of FinTech there. We're doing the sole print over there with a whole bunch of young people. And I, I know I'd say sole print kind of flippantly, but it's pretty cool. 
head of fintech who then is in charge of blockchain technology, right? Cryptocurrency is going to be related directly to the assets of the country, to the happiness of the people. It's all possible. Well, and, it's all and so there. Is it leadership? Is that is that the? It's leadership. So you I mean Yoon, who is the prime minister for almost fifty years. Now his son is the prime minister, right? Uh, maybe it's time, for, you know, family. But whatever. Uh, you know, they're the fact is they're having a conversation amongst the youth, saying, "What's what's the next fifty years going to look like? We've been so successful. Uh, can we sustain it?" Um, and you can say all kinds of things about, you know, rules and, you know, it's very buttoned down society is very Chinese in, in, in that way. But it is a model for China, actually. Yeah. There's a quote that just came up on the on the chat. The one who plants trees knowing that he'll never sit in their shade has at least started to understand the meaning of life. Yeah. And I know I went off on Singapore. What was the first your the previous comment you made well we were just talking about how we were talking about how to create a mature conversation and and right, right, right. getting getting beyond uh, populist politics and, yeah. and and the problem is not the pipeline the problem is not trains the problem is that we have a rapidly transitioning uh, well, energy infrastructure that... well, let, you know, let, let's talk about that you know if I've written articles on LinkedIn we've done the math um, to think that Albertans and the oil patch in Calgary didn't see in the rear view mirror the Americans coming with all their fracking. You know, they they've just Americans have just announced that they're they're gonna probably hit 17 million barrels a day of own production. That's only, and that's that's almost 20% of global global yeah. demand right now. Well they're only using 18 or 19, right? And how much do we export from Alberta? Five, is it? Two no. and a half, let's say. Okay. So you do the math. What you think Mr. Trump or anyone's going to need our oil in two years? Oh, well, maybe it'll only last for five years for them. But the fact is, we're we're in a big pickle, and you know we're not going to build a pipeline overnight. And and why do we think the Chinese are going to pay the Saudi price of oil for our oil? You know, on and on and on. So it's like, wait a minute. So let's do a scenario where we're only producing two and a half million barrels a day, not five, not. You know, no pipelines. We're just going to produce what we need. Uh, maybe, we'll, hopefully, we get it to Eastern Canada. Because why are they buying it from Venezuela? You know, um, why don't we have a different discussion? What? Why do we maybe think about withdrawing our transfer payments to the to the have not provinces in in exchange for uh, how about uh, discounted oil prices? Another question I ask: Who sets the price of Alberta's Western Canadian Select? It's a little town called Hardesty. Dakota, have you been to Hardesty? Because I don't know what's going on in Hardesty, where the price of oil is set by some farmer, uh, I don't know, in, in Tim Hortons. Yeah, and, there's, there's like there's like 150 people in that town. <laughs> I know. And you look you look on Google Earth, he's like, who, what, who's there? Like this Gibson Energy or something. Like, you say, well, how does it, the Alberta price of oil get so discounted? Like, don't we control our own price? I mean... And I keep going as a Suncor Energy. It used to be the great Canadian oil sands. Our grandparents had shares, right? We owned Suncor Energy and now it's happened, right? On and on and on. So it's like, unless we get mature and, you know, we've shut in coal, we've done it. We've written off all those plants. We're fine. We can produce enough electricity, whether two plants, Shepherd plant out of Calgary will produce enough electricity from natural gas for half the households in Alberta. Right, so do the math. Let's have a mature conversation without a bunch of hot air, um, and figure out. You know, maybe America will be completely in, independent. And yes, there will be electric cars. There will be more electric cars, and maybe we need more electricity. But we can maybe then increase our electrical production, or more hydro. You know, more solar panels. We have more sunshine hours in Germany. And how many solar panels do you see on people's roofs? So those are the kind of conversations I would like to have based on real data. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what if scenarios that are reasonable? One of the things that that Rob and I have have uh, uh, keeps coming up in our in our conversations, and it's it's coming in again here is is uh, you're you're familiar with with uh, Taleb's work. Uh, no, 
This well, is, I, I know Taleb, but yeah, aphorism. Okay, so so he's uh, this is this is one of his his um, his books and his, his inserto series called the this one's called the Bed of Procrustes, and it's just basically a book of af aphorisms. But the <clears throat> the the, the aphorism of, of the bed of Procrustes is, is really interesting one and it, it applies to, to this conversation and almost all of the problems that we're facing right now as a as a species in that um, so pro the Procrustes was a was a Greek innkeeper who uh, allegedly had two different sizes of beds he had a, a really short bed and a really tall bed and and if uh, if an, if a guest would come to his his inn and they wanted to stay overnight uh, Procrustes prided himself in the ability to make sure that every single guest fit his beds with absolute perfection. So they were just, <laughs> just slid in really nicely, um, except his way of, of making sure they fit to perfection is that um, if, if, a, if, a, uh, if somebody who was staying overnight was, was too short, he would stretch them between two horses to make sure that they fit. And if they were too tall, he would cut off some of their legs or <laughs> cut off the top of their head so that they fit with absolute perfection. And the, the whole idea of, of this, this, you know, just farcical story is that, that the, um, uh, the, uh, a, a, a Procrustean bed is a situation when somebody is trying to solve a problem by changing the wrong variable. And so I was like, why, why would you, why not just make the bed bigger? <laughs> like, why cut off the guy's feet? And, and so it's so funny where like we, we have all these problems like you know like the the environment is destroyed. There's a gulf, there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's you know whatever twenty thousand square kilometers. Yeah. You know, phosphorus is going to run out in thirty years. No, like, all ten. these things. Ten years. <laughs> ten, yeah. And and so like all these problems and 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 we're trying to solve them by cutting off the feet of of the people and like you know these austerity measures and all these things. When it's like why not just have a real conversation about the guy with the axe? who's doing the chopping and get him out of there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, actually, we can't, we can't as a society. And it's just, it's, it's frustrating because this, this keeps coming up. Um, so yeah, what, why, why can't we talk about this? Like, I, it, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I, I do not understand why we don't have a, uh, an open and, you know, authentic conversation. You know, and, and I've, I pointed out to, uh, asked Preston Manning once, I said, you know, why are the deaths in the legislature in rows like this, you know? And he said in the public auditorium in Cochrane, he goes, you know, Mark, it's like, the, the reason those deaths are exactly that far apart in the British legislature, you, you've seen them, right? You saw a picture of them last night with Elizabeth May or, or whatever her name is, Theresa May, sorry, not, not Elizabeth. But uh, he said, because they're exactly two sword lengths apart, so if you <laughs> swung at your your opponent with a broadsword, you just miss them. And he said, and that mace, you know, that big mace they have sitting there? It was yeah. meant to club commoners should they storm. And I said, Can't do you not see a, a day when we'll sit in circle and pass the like the yeah the, the kitchen spoon or the eagle feather? And he says, the existing members of parliament don't have the courage, Mark, to do that. But we can show them how he says. I said, yeah. so when are we going to sit in circle and have a conversation without distracting and interrupting each other, <laughs> and just listen yeah. to these amazing stories and ideas like you're leading, right? It's like it just—it's unbelievable. We're as human beings. We're just so pathetic. <laughs> so, so I have a herbalist that uh, that we work with. We used to teach courses with him, and he talked about how. Uh, the indigenous chiefs, um, when they were getting ready to go to war, would try and avert war, and they would they would smoke this herb um, that grows on the prairie, and uh -huh. it would it would uh, they get the two chiefs that were ready to go to war or fight uh, to smoke this, and the herb would literally paralyze them from the head down, <laughs> and they would they would uh, sit next to each other, probably fuming at each other. Um, in paralysis for however long this herb actually worked until they actually came to some sort of a um, peaceful resolution. Um, and I just wonder if maybe we have to get all our MLAs to smoke this. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we need ayahuasca or in fact, I don't think we need any drugs, but whatever, maybe some of us do need to do mushrooms to 
Well, this wouldn't this wouldn't affect them psychoactively. It just it just got their limbs to stop working, so they wouldn't be able to hit each other with swords and maces and and. Well, uh, it's a better alternative than, as Dakota said, chopping your feet off or head off, part of your head off, so you can fit. <laughs> oh, it's true, right? I mean, I, I love my indigenous friends because they remind us, that, and they you know they have such a great sense of humor in spite of us, literally just literally annihilating them. Yeah. You know, I, and they had such wisdom, uh, these matrilineal cultures where there was no male chief and council. That's an artifact of, of the British dominant system. Mm-hmm. Right? They, they sat and the, saying there's too many chiefs, right? That just meant there were a lot of us who had opinions. And if there was a time of war, then it, when in time of peace or time of planting, you had different right leaders and medicine men. And so I think we have a lot to learn from, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, American system was based on the Iroquois Confederacy model. Yeah. Did, they, did they have conflict before? They told me the story 2,000 years ago before any of us came here. They, some dude, some great white brother came and gave them the law of peace. Right? Because they were in conflict too. They were fighting each other, killing each other. And somehow they adopted. And it was the women who carried those laws in their DNA. Right? Those are the stories I hear. And I'm like, what? how come we got so far off the rails? Like Ben Franklin was tapped into that. So was George Washington. You know, it was about wampum. It was about potlatch. And, and we destroyed, we took all that away because we thought the British system or the codification of law under British rule, which they borrowed from the Romans was, is the right and wise thing to do. It's just, anyways, we, we have a lot, we have a lot of tough love ahead, I think. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, so one of the, the prime directives in permaculture is, which is one of the reasons that it, it really resonated with me, and I think with a lot of people, is that we 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 look to policy and to politicians to, to lead society, but it seems that it's very difficult for them to do that. They're always being pulled in multiple directions, and, and uh, you know, with the, the, the fact that we don't have our own sovereign currency and that, that money is really debt and that's really just controlled by the people that have the, the levers. Um, it gets really disempowering really quickly. And so the prime directive of permaculture is to take responsibility for, for your life and that of your children and, and to get your home and garden in order. Uh, and, and that's an analogy, but it's also um, a truism as well so that they shelter and feed us. Um, right, right. And so where does, in your opinion, Mark, where does, um, uh, kind of being self-directed and and not not anarchist as, as a, a negative word, um, but but more just um, taking responsibility for our own actions. I mean, it's very easy for us peons at, at the lower echelons of society to point fingers about what our politicians aren't aren't and aren't are and aren't doing. Uh, but at some point, we got to put our own hard earned on the table, I think, um, and, and take action. And I'm curious what your take on that is. Well, I always think that it's grossly unfair that we put so much weight on, I don't care if it's Jason Kennedy or Rachel Lawley, whoever the premier is, right? That they, they hold so much responsibility. Uh, I think it's unjust and unfair. And I don't know how to change that because that's the way the system is geared so that you can control a few, one person at the top, right? right. If, you want, if you want to be hard, hard-nosed about this. So again, going back to that indigenous model, how do we, how do we create a system in which all the answers are in the circle, right? All the answers to a question. Dakota's got some experience with permaculture. Is it a model for Alberta on a larger scale? I don't know, maybe. But can we not create a democracy? My, my friend from Washington this morning, we were talking about what's the alternative to the current system where the republic's falling apart? democracy is not working the way we maybe thought it should and how do we experiment with a new system in which not all the power rests or weight rests in the, in the office of one person where we expect we can of course it's easy we can blame you can blame rachel and all you can blame jason kenny if he's premier right it's easy but if we sit together and share responsibility and ideas and hopes then we, you know, I think we're just 
maybe it's more complicated. Maybe it takes more time to come to, I mean, we're not even arguing for consensus model, right? But surely we can, you know, we can try to experiment that way. And again, permaculture gives us some guiding principles that yeah. presumably work, right? You, you have evidence that, yeah, you compromise some productivity or yields, but hopefully you get the evidence of better soil structure down the road, right? And you're curious about the interrelationship with the plants on the land, right? And that the insects and the birds and everything else is kind of, it's co, you know, it's the a coexistence, it's harmony, it's, it's everything we want. I mean, it's like Eden again, but right. we, I, I always think we, we kind of, we sort of gorged on that tree of knowledge so, so long that we've forgotten <laughs> the beauty of, of how natural systems are keep showing us, right? That, yeah, and we yeah. say no, we're, we're we're too busy. Sorry, we're busy, you know, growing the GDP. But uh, but and we can't be see we could, because arguably we cannot afford to be permaculture, right? Because we need to get the yields. We need to export, export. I was like, why? Mm -hmm. What if what if we just? Of course, I'll I still want coffee and oranges and bananas, right? But what if what if the economy is just based on living off the land, the ability of Alberta's land base? Yeah. Would we close our borders? Could we close our borders? Uh, I'm not saying we don't trade, but again, indigenous people teach us, did they, did we, did we actually want to wander to Newfoundland for cod? <laughs> no way. No. When I can get whitefish from, you know, Slave Lake, or I can get pemmican from, you know. Uh, so those are kind of the practical things I think we have to really debate. <clears throat> yeah, ab absolutely. And, uh, you know, just to, I just want to finish up this this off with a with a quote from from Bill Mollison. He's he's the one of the co-founders of Permaculture, and and this kind of relates back to the the idea of the, the prime directive and kind of what people can do, yeah, uh, to to try to you know to to take it from the why not to the why, right, he, right, right. He said, you know, back in the nineteen seventies. Uh, you know, we're talking like 60 years ago, the, the greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production. Even if on a small scale in our own gardens, if only 10% of us do this, there's enough for everyone. Hence, the futility, yeah. hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens and who depend on the very system they attack and who produce words and bullets, not food and shelter. And so, you know, I, I love this. The, That's um, profound. That's a profound thought, right? It's um, profound. Um, and consumption you know, production. The, that's a kind of, par there's a paradox there, right? It's like, wait a minute, you're saying we should produce more and life will be better actually. Uh, yes, that's true, right? Yeah, well, but but also like, like built into that is, is the idea of like what actual production is. And, and you know, the you mentioned right now our, uh, our, our species goal, whether it's conscious or subconscious is growth. And, and, and we're using a, a very few metrics to, to measure that, that goal. One of them is GDP. The other one you mentioned was yield, kind of agricultural yield, <clears throat> but none of those are qualitative. They're That's both right. just a number on a spreadsheet or an output on a combine as you're going through a field. But when yeah. you look at it in terms of, you know, qualitative measurements of, you know, are you actually happier? Is there more well-being? Is the nutrient density of the food uh, increasing? Or do you have to eat twice as much bread to get the same amount of of, you know, manganese and magnesium that you got 30, 40 years ago. And so like the, the, our, the metrics that we're using to, to justify why we're doing these things have been so skewed. To put this into perspective, there's a great article. Rob's actually, he's, he read it on YouTube from, uh, uh, it's called The Oil We Eat. Who's the author of that one, Rob? Uh, Richard Manning. Richard Manning. Oh, the oil we eat, yeah. th basically, yeah, the, the oil we eat. The, for every one calorie of, of food that we eat, there's 10 calories of energy somewhere else in the system that it took to just manufacture and transport that. that right. That's not even, that's not even the growth or that that's not even the energy that it took to grow the food. So we're looking at like 20 to 30 to one uh, for the energy that we're putting. This is, it's absolutely not sustainable. So to, to talk about feeding the world through industrial agriculture, it's like, it's, it's physically impossible. Eventually we will run out of energy. We'll run out of phosphorus. We'll run out of all these things. It's a straw um, man. 
Yeah, it's a, we, we need to move back to these bioregionally appropriate food systems like you're talking about, where we only trade high value, uh, you know, low, um, low weight foods across borders, things like herbs and spices and salt, which were all, always traded by indigenous cultures. Yeah. And the, yeah. the bulk majority is produced in our backyards in these, uh, these you know, um, uh, communities that are modeled off of, of ecological principles. And, and, and we, 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 have, we have the tools that we need to start experimenting. Um, yeah. And, and absolutely. Yeah. Your, and your, your, your book, I think, really um, pulls out, at least in my, my opinion, one of, the, one of the lead measures that needs to be addressed first, which is how we, how we exchange value, uh, because money is a very useful tool. And right now it's, it's hard, to, yeah. hard to think of a world without that. But if we just kept the same tool and assigned a different value to it as a culture, a value that took into the, the quantitative and the qualitative metrics, that alone would have a profound impact on and a ripple effect on so many other of these problems that we're dealing with. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And as you said, we're, you know, we use yields for it as a proxy of, of success, but in fact, we should use some proxy for soil health and vitality as a proxy of success. Yeah, exactly. Because and the yields and the eventually be exhausted if you don't have any fertilizer inputs and, you know, you, you exhaust the natural ability to generate the future yield and uh but those qualitative things are, don't come into the equation the accounting i know that you know that i know that from working with alberta eggs it's like it's like hello uh, how about the soil can we measure the soil's consciousness you know like what, what <laughs> talking about? It's like yeah look my naturopath can do that you can tell me what food to eat for my body like, yeah. yeah everything's energy everything's frequency so we can you know we don't have to go crazy on that but it's like you know, there are different nuanced ways of measuring integrity. Totally. Yeah. One of the, one of our colleagues um, has a book that they've written called the eight forms of capital. And uh, he really tries to, to broaden the conversation around what capital actually is. And it includes things like soil and well-being right. and, and um, you know, those are, those are nice to be, seeing those types of, of conversations, at least within our circles as well. And I think that the, that, that the books that you've written here provide um, uh, a lot more granularity um, within some of those categories, um, which I think is, is uh, worth people's time, definitely worth people's time to invest in, and, and, and learn more about this. I mean, part of how you've addressed this conversation, Mark, is, is by writing books and hosting podcasts and, and giving incredible talks at conferences, um, we all have to do something. Um, yeah, and, uh, and you've certainly started the conversation, which is which is incredible. And you too, you're using that platform. I mean, I was told that you know young people will be more engaged in, in podcasts than they will anything else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what you're doing is a service. Like we we have to have these conversations, and you know, hopefully you know, your YouTube channel would be immutable, like a blockchain uh, smart contract, <laughs> right? That uh, 20 years from now, our daughters will listen, like, that wasn't that crazy after all. <laughs> See, I met that Dakota dude, like he's, <laughs> he's now farming all of China with, you know. <laughs> totally. Awesome. Well, this has been a really great conversation. I think we could, we could continue it on. Um, in another show, I think there's lots more to talk about. Um, but I wanted to to personally thank you, Mark and Dakota. And I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to to finish with any closing thoughts today. Um, and then we'll we'll do a wrap up, both of you guys. Mark, do you want to go first? Well, I, I guess my my closing thoughts are more on so what are we gonna do in the in the next uh, few months when the campaign starts again for the next uh, next elected government? Uh, and maybe maybe this little YouTube can go viral, just like the Gillette commercial. I mean, like, are we going to talk about, you know, uh, how are we going to have a conversation about taking shared responsibility for our future in a respectful way that says, it doesn't matter what political color you wear. Like, we're all in this together. And that's what I would like us to sort of think about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll just iterate that too. For me, this, conversa this conversation starts with 
clarifying what our, our, our vision is as a species and what's important to us. And really have a conversation about that because uh, that's the only way we can move forward to try to start uh, designing solutions to all these problems is to try to figure out where we're going to go. There's this beautiful quote from Seneca, which is, um, uh, um, if, if, if you do not know to which port you're sailing, no wind is favorable. And right now we've got like a thousand horsepower engine that's just given her and we have, and there's no rudder and we have no idea where we're going. And, and there's, we're just having a, you know, booze cruise basically on this, this, uh, this boat here. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, like the, the, the first thing we need to do is figure out where are we going and, and how are we, and how are we going to know when we get there and, and what are our metrics of success and, and really thinking about that in a circle. And when you start talking about that, it's not about the left or the right or, or uh, you know, Jordan Peterson versus Sam Harris. Exactly. Or, yeah. It all, it all melts away. It's like people all want the same thing. They want, they want, they want a healthy, happy family. They want, um, they want an environment that's clean and they want their children and future generations to be able to enjoy the same things or better than what we have, that they had. And those are the yeah. three ethics of the culture. Common, common across the world. I don't care. You go to China or Tibet or Germany, same, yeah. same, same. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. not only are we on a booze cruise though, Dakota, uh, but we don't really have a rudder. It's more like we have truck nuts. Um, so I think we actually need uh, we need a rudder. So, speaking about booze, if anyone you. <laughs> Any one of you want to get into business of uh, distilling real Alberta bourbon? I mean, whiskey, because I can't produce bourbon here, apparently. But uh, <laughs> I want some real grains from uh, Dakota's you know, land to okay. make sure. the best damn, you know, if the Japanese can make good whiskey, we can't do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, awesome. yeah. Well, th there's, there's a new distillery that just opened up in Edmonton. Have you, uh, have you heard about them? It's the first distillery ever. Really? In Edmonton, I can't remember the name of it, but they're making like a Seabock Thorn gin. Okay, that's uh, I think Strathcona uh, Distillery or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I'm talking about. Come on, we have to get like you know twelve year age whiskeys going. Here. <laughs> yeah. I might not live long enough to taste it, but it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway. Cool. I'll just close with uh, with with a comment that you made there, Mark. That um, and, and and echoed by Dakota that. Um, that it, you know, really, uh, we put too much emphasis on expecting our leaders to make all of these decisions. It's impossible for them to make a decision that's good yeah. for everybody. Exactly. And we need to start uh, taking responsibility for our own actions. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm just going to put in a shameless plug here. We, we get together on a monthly basis at the Calgary Permaculture Community Group, where these types of conversations do happen. Um, and in fact, once the group gets large enough, um, the goal has always been that we will split apart into additional groups, we'll breed into new groups, and the groups will be named after the political riding that they sit in. So Permaculture Calgary Ward 6, Permaculture Calgary Ward 7. And what's great about that and, and the strategy of this community group is that um, if we have young, old dogs, uh, people, humans, cats, um, <laughs> turtles showing up to these events, and there's 100 people showing up to these events and they're talking about composting toilets and locally grown food um, and rainwater harvesting systems and renewable energy and soil and all the other things that come along within the permaculture design framework. And our politicians will start showing up on their own because they'll recognize that there's a group of 100 people meeting in a group that's named after a political riding. And we never have to put a sign up about what we don't want. We just have to talk about where we're going. Yeah, and they'll yeah, do yeah. the math on it and they'll realize that if there's a hundred diverse people in that group meeting on a monthly basis in a group called permaculture named after that political riding, that if they don't start voting for those people, that they represent two to 3000 people within that riding. And it could mean the difference between a job for them. Um, and wow. if we're not thinking about it in those types of strategies, we're just going to continue to spin our wheels and we're going to be stuck to the Twitter sphere and populist politics because we're all too busy to take responsibility for the direction of our country, our province, or our city. Yeah, that's fantastic. That sounds like political permaculture to me. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. And so, yeah. so if you're interested in joining us on a monthly basis, we share incredible food and conversation. You don't have to start with 
talking about how the Flames or the Oilers are doing uh, at our potlucks. And uh, you can find information on that uh, at the Calgary Permaculture Community Group. Um, we're always looking for new board members and volunteers to help coordinate, co coordinate this. Um, and we'd love to see you out there. So, Mark, I want to personally thank you for uh, taking the time today to chat with us. Thank you. Uh, same with you, Dakota. And uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Oh, another plug, March 2nd, uh, Dakota and I will be in Calgary for the uh, Calgary Permaculture or whatever get-together. Well, uh, cabin oh, fever. Cabin, cabin fever. Oh, oh, awesome. I, I, didn't, I didn't know you were going to be there, too. Mark, I think, looking for I think they're looking now. for speakers. Do you want to speak at it? I am speaking at it. Oh, perfect. I didn't realize that. I'm yeah. not on the board. My wife is, so that's fantastic. Oh, I can't yeah, wait. No, uh, yeah, I just got approached by them, so. Because I talked to Moore, right? She says, "Oh, could you maybe want to do this thing?" And I said, "If you put yeah. me up in Palliser, I'll go." Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the permaculture Palliser? That's my basement. There you yeah. go. <laughs> all right, all right, sounds good. So, thanks so much, guys, and uh, YouTube. If you guys have found this useful, please hit the like button, uh, share it with your friends if you found some nuggets of information in here, um, and hit subscribe if you want to be notified when we go live again. And uh, we'll see you guys all in the next video. Have a fantastic day. Okay.